In mid-February, a snowstorm hit Texas. This event was highly unusual as Texas rarely gets this cold. The cold weather caused by a weakening of the polar vortex resulting in Arctic air moving south over the continental United States. But it wasn't the snowstorm that was a problem, it was the power outages. Due to the February snowstorms, many Texas power plants, most having never undergone winterization, were knocked offline. The state's power infrastructure, left crippled by the winter storm, could not keep up with demand, resulting in power outages throughout the state. 4.5 million homes and businesses were left without power, some for several days without heating when outside temperatures are at negative 22 degrees Celsius. Subsequent food and water shortages manifested. And once power was restored, the true extent of the damage was revealed. 210 confirmed dead with estimates as high as 700. $195 billion in damages. The worst part, all of this didn't have to happen. There is one big problem with electricity generation, volatility. Localized demand for electricity is often extremely volatile, with demand changing depending on the time of day and the weather. But more than 60 years ago, we solved this problem by creating statewide and interstate electricity grids. A larger power grid will smooth out the peaks in electricity demand due to the sheer number of people connected to it, allowing for more efficient electricity generation. In the United States, there are two major grids, the Eastern Interconnection, which covers the entire East Coast and the Midwest, and the Western Interconnection connection, which covers the entire West Coast and the Rocky Mountain states. Back when these grids were being built nearly 90 years ago, Texas decided to opt out of joining one of them because joining a national power grid meant that they could be regulated by the federal government. This desire to not join the national power grids was set in stone in 1935 when Roosevelt signed the Federal Power Act, which regulates electricity sales that cross the state lines. Congress passed this bill to combat the shady business practices of large utility companies at the time. Because of the Federal Power Act, Texas opted to keep their their entire power grid inside Texas borders and memorialized it through a written agreement. Although Texas's statewide power grid allowed Texas utility companies to be less regulated, the separate power grid is not without its problems. For example, during the February winter storm, Oklahoma suffered similar power failures, but it could still get power from power plants in Missouri, Kansas, and Arkansas, which prevented statewide rolling blackouts. Texas being on a separate grid than the rest of the U.S. explains why it took so long for power to return in many places in Texas, but it doesn't explain how the power outages started in the first place. When the snowstorm hit, every single source of electricity was affected. Wind turbine blades started icing, coal power plants stopped working as coal piles froze, and one of four Texas nuclear power plants went offline. But nothing was more affected than natural gas. Natural gas power plants are uniquely vulnerable to cold weather because natural gas contains water vapor. As temperatures started to dip below freezing, the demand for natural gas skyrocketed as power plants had to compete with natural gas heaters in residential homes. This increased demand strained natural gas suppliers, and as the pipes froze, natural gas power plants went offline one after another. In total, 15,000 megawatts of capacity from natural gas power plants went offline in 8 hours on the morning of February 15, 2021. As power plant after power plant went offline in Texas, ERCOT, the operator of Texas's grids, did the only thing it could, lower the demand for electricity through rolling blackouts. In theory, these rolling blackouts were designed to inconvenience residents as little as possible by stopping power for 30 minutes to a certain number of households. But but in many places, power plants were so strained that households didn't have power for three days. And on top of that, on the morning of February 15th, the Texas power grid was minutes away from a complete grid failure. As the energy crisis worsened on the morning of February 15th, the grid frequency started to slip due to an imbalance of supply and demand caused by power plants going offline. Since many parts of the grid are magnetically synchronized, a change in frequency of the power grid will destroy equipment. Normally, American power grids operate at 60 Hz, but by 1.50 am, the frequency frequency fell below 59.4 Hz, a critical threshold. If the frequency of the power grid stayed below 59.4 Hz for over 9 minutes, it would have triggered circuit breakers and power plants, which would have lowered the frequency even more and would cascade until every single Texas power plant was disconnected from the grid. Luckily, after 5 minutes, the frequency of the power grid rose above 59.4 Hz. This power crisis happened because Texas was unprepared. In colder states and countries, power plants have to undergo winterization, but since Texas normally 
normally doesn't go below freezing in the winter, power companies failed to winterize their power plants. This was not the first time power companies had to start rolling blackouts due to cold weather in Texas either. In 1989, a similar polar vortex brought freezing temperatures to much of Texas, causing rolling blackouts. In 2011, the same thing happened again. Both times, federal regulators recommended Texas utilities to winterize their power plants. In both times, Texas utilities failed to winterize because the Texas Utility Commission made those upgrades optional. Although Texas's vulnerability to the cold is a uniquely Texan thing, Texas's power failures serve as a warning to the rest of the United States. Most of the US grid was built more than 60 years ago, and most of it is not built to handle the increasingly intense natural disasters that are occurring due to climate change. So we're seeing more storms occurring than ever before uh, in recorded history, and we're also seeing the storms that do occur are more severe, so the increased frequency and increased severity. Hurricanes is a big one. We're seeing more hurricanes become present during the hurricane season in North America, and of storms that form hurricanes, there are higher classes, class four, class five hurricanes, where those used to be class two, class three hurricanes. We're seeing soil moisture being decreased all over the world because heat is also what causes evaporation. Now that we have more water in the water cycle, and that's increasing the total amount of water and flooding and damage associated with storms as well. And this is not a problem we can afford to put off. Recently, New Orleans experienced a total blackout for a week due to Hurricane Ida, which destroyed all eight transmission lines into New Orleans. Storms such as the February winter storm and Hurricane Ida will only get more intense in the future due to climate change. And we've seen that current American infrastructure will not hold up in the future. Climate change is not going away and these extreme weather events will only get worse. We need to accept this and adapt to these new circumstances. And to do that, we need a massive investment in infrastructure.